I think you can see the screen now, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So sorry for about the delay, and uh, usually my pace is quite high. So uh, let, let's just move on. On this is this really important topic on, on machine learning and what it can bring to to, to the field of um, of data analysis, uh, prediction, understanding more about medicine. Uh, so I, I think my some collaborators, Ben van Kalster is a colleague in uh, Leuven uh, I've worked with, and Maarten van Smede, who's also really very active at Twitter. If you follow him, it's amazing. Uh, he usually sends four tweets a day, uh, quite nice and provocative. Um, so I stole some from his um, material. So I'll first give kind of the set the scene, uh, introduction for a debate, and I hope we have time for some, some interaction. Uh, the friction points, where where are the foes, where do the machine learning, uh, the, the field as, as a whole, I'm not, not specifically pointing at it, there are of course very knowledgeable people in this field, but so the field as such, and try to characterize that a bit in the competition with, with uh, classical statistics, and then some commonalities between statistics and the machine learning field. So, um, to give a definition, to know what we are talking about, uh, briefly, artificial intelligence just means machine learning. Um, machine and algorithms. That's what I'm talking about in this uh, today. Um, in medical research, uh, it's very popular. Uh, you all know that. So if it got, apparently there were already some papers with machine learning in it in the 60s. And then if you see this enormous uh, steep rise in 2021, over 20,000 hits in PubMed, um, radiomics based on magnetic resonance and rise in preoperative prediction of lymph node metastasis and head, neck, and machine learning study. Well, yeah, I, I'm. what will happen to this study? Uh, it is published. Um, the chance it will be validated is small. The chance it will end up in any practical application is, is, is really very minor, very slim. That's, that's the state of affairs we have. If you look for prediction in particular, so the previous was also prediction, then um, there were, you cannot see that, but also several thousands in the recent years. It's everywhere, right? We have these papers in really big journals, uh, development validation of an imaging differentiation in Parkinson, uh, machine learning to forecast. Um, also some perspectives, uh, these are popping up more and more, do no harm, uh, responsible machine learning, some thoughts about that. Here, something about the data infrastructure that we may need to do these kind of um, approaches, machine learning. It's all increasing. And this I liked, and doctors about to be replaced by hospital AI systems offering better diagnosis and less arrogance. So if you see this picture, what, what do you see? It took me some time to understand what was going on. First, I thought it was about the arrogance here yeah, with these crossed uh, arms uh, in, in front of the doctor. Uh, but now probably it should mean that he is just impressed, he's looking at what the AI does. The, probably this is a kind of a Da Vinci robot or so doing a surgery, something like that. And it's referring to a Massachusetts-based uh, firm here that advises Southeast Asia. Um, yeah, there are success stories for AI and the quite complex game of Go. The computer was better at that than the, than the world champion. Um, so he was defeated and he, he here, he, uh, he, he's, he's, his statement is, even if I become number one, there is an entity that cannot be defeated. And so really the machines take over. And that was also happening with uh, IBM Watson uh, winning the Jeopardy game. Uh, here uh, he's in the middle, far higher score. And that uh, was taken up by IBM, in the IBM Watson for oncology, Dr. Watson. I found this picture on the internet this morning. So really a very friendly looking robot computer. Uh, he's open-minded, he's kind, he knows everything, big brain, and he shakes hands with men, right? Something like that. But unfortunately, it was unsafe and incorrect to recommend cancer treatments. We know the story for MD Anderson um, that, that was used there and, and, and failed. And I just checked the internet on some background. So they spent, IBM, a big, big company, spent a decade trying to make Watson Health. Uh, it was uh, really, they talk about not millions, but billions of dollars invested, 5 billion, diagnosing patients, recommending treatment options. Here yeah, they say billions invested, uh, but they had many problems and now they're selling it. And this is a recent update from, from this year. 
So what were problems and what can we learn from that? Um, well, what they what what this uh, reporter writes is that at least we should uh, focus on on we should understand the problem and focus on the domain that that we that we are familiar with. And here the analysis is that Watson, IBM, uh, uh, had a hammer looking for a nail, right? Riding on Watson's success in in jeopardy, they wanted AI for everything, uh, medical imaging, but also trial recruitment, for example. So that is a a, a risk identified probably not so wise. Uh, the other thing that I really also like the emphasis on is that the, we, we need really high quality representative data. This is for any learning system, uh, whether we talk about statistics or about machine learning, of course, uh, the data are really essential. Uh, so the statement uh, machine learning tool is as good, uh, only as good as the data that goes into it. Yes. And the setbacks was that this cancer diagnostic tool was not trained with real patient data, but with hypothetical cases, with doctor's knowledge. So synthetic data are not necessarily bad, but uh, Watson didn't seem to account for the fact that it uh, re reflected the doctor's own biases and not really generalizable to all patient cases. So unsafe recommendations, and they, uh, it was a failure, this success, uh, the, the, the system. And the third lesson I like to uh, that I took from this uh, blog um, is the marketing hype, and that that was also the motivation for the title of this talk um, on, on the yeah, the hype element in it. The, that uh, they wanted just they wanted to do something with AI uh, to uh, the results should live up to the hype they were creating. And then the comment here is that disruptive innovations that is a gamble, yes, but you can go too far. So that is maybe. Also for the debate later on, uh, is it really going too far? I cannot apply for a grant in the EU uh, to get money from, from uh, without mentioning machine learning on AI somewhere. If I would say I'm going to do logistic regression, then people would say, well, that's boring. I have a quote later on. So there is friction, and let me try to go through some points, at, at least as I try to summarize them. Um, so it's about that machine learning claims to be new and supersede statistics. The machine learning um, community claims uh, that just any data that you have is relevant. And there's insufficient attention to the data quality. And finally, it makes promises that it cannot keep. And that is not, that is not trustworthy. So about uh, the newness, uh, let's start with the, a cartoon. Uh, the, there's a crack in the wall statistics. Well, if you put a frame around it, it already looks a bit better. And then you name it machine learning, but even better, more, more audio, uh, many more people in the audience, artificial intelligence. And, and the comment I just made on the logistic regression being a, a boring, that is, was literally the case here in this review. Uh, this logistic regression is often inferior to the powerful machine learning algorithms. And look at the powerful. So, um, um, example of a random forest or boosting, focusing on logistic regression can only be boring. This is a, just a literal quote. Sorry. So um, one, we've all gotten those quotes. The same. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah. No. It, and that is the hype element and that that we are say suffering from. There may be some some good things in that I will also try to address. But uh, yeah, this is the kind of the total the, the attitude of the reviewer community. So one solution is to say, okay, let's just say that logistic regression is machine learning. And that is this uh, tweet. Then you just fit everything under machine learning. And that uh, there's something to say for that, I think, because these at least machine learning methods come from statistics. And see, these are really uh, founding fathers of this field, uh, Leo Bryman, and uh, we'll have a a screenshot of one of his famous papers, a great statistician who also really evolved towards uh, yeah, modern method, card methods, random forest, especially. Uh, Friedman, um, gradient boosting, uh, professor of statistics originally, and Trevor Hasty, also professor of statistics. And this is a, really a Bible for, for statistical learning, the book that he wrote with Deep uh, Shiani. So, um, this is this paper from, from Ryman and the, the two cultures. So there's a kind of a, a trick. Huh? How would this sentence continue? There are two cultures in the use of statistical modeling to, and some might think, well, to address scientific questions or 
to do research or so, but it's really immediately on data. And so there are two cultures in the use of statistical modeling to reach conclusions from data. And so it's really the data-driven element that is central, learning from data. The one is learning uh, from data by a stochastic data model and the other uses algorithm, algorithmic models, treats the data mechanisms as unknown. So that is then also in the paper in this graphic that you have an outcome Y that you observe and there are some characteristics X and there is a model in between linear regression, logistic or Cox, uh, the most common models in epidemiology. Or the algorithmic modeling culture where there is this Y and an X, but there's this unknown in between the decision trees, neural networks, flexible methods are in between that are not so stringent about a stochastic model and about uh, testing for assumptions of distributions, etc. that would not fit with this second culture. And the language is also very different. So uh, here these are these columns for statistics and machine learning. Here again, statistics machine learning. And there's sort of on the web, you can find many of these, uh, these lists. And in general, the machine learning guys did really a good job here because the terminology is just far more fancy. And so if you say various <laughs> as a statistician versus uh, features, and uh, features is just, just nice. Uh, the parameters, no, the weights, uh, cross entropy loss. Yeah. We still don't know what it is, perhaps, but it is, sounds good. Um, one hot encoding, wow. And, and there are some other really nice terms, and uh, but it is confusing. Huh? For example, uh, we in the classical statistics, and, and then David alluded to the prediction context, there this ROC curve, receiver operating characteristic curve, is very common to indicate performance of a model, uh, which is sensitivity against one minus specificity. In the machine learning world, you often see these precision recall curves, but recall is just sensitivity and precision is positive predictive value. If you don't know that, it's really it's a bit magic what's going on in the, in the AI world, right? But this is just anonymous. And there are other yeah, things like ground truth, and right? that also really sounds, sounds good to me. So uh, machine learners have their own language and there is a translation possible, um, but in general, they, they have this fancy naming. Where to place machine learning? I found this graphic. I know it is related to computer science, machine learning in the middle here, math and statistics that I understand. But this hacking skills, I was really surprised. So this is partly a joke. I don't know where this came from. So uh, the other famous paper I'd like to just, just mention to set the scene is the, by David Hent, a famous statistician again in the UK, uh, classifier technology and the illusion of progress. So David, you will like this illusion of progress, right? To put something like that in the title. Um, and the conclusion here, it says really in particular, simple methods yield performance almost as good as more sophisticated methods to the extent that the performance <laughs> may be swamped by other sources of uncertainty. And that's what we really need to realize. There are so many sources of uncertainty in data quality in context. And that needs to be considered uh, either in classical or in, in modern uh, classification uh, systems. So illusion of progress, that's what he claims. Well, so that is to set the scene. And now, now this first point, uh, machine learning claims to be new and supersede statistics. Um, yeah, it has developed from statistics. Um, so I, you could see machine learning as part of statistics or statistics as part of machine learning. And they're closely related in their basics and in, uh, in fitting uh, some kind of model, a bit more flexible in the machine learning case to data. And so, as I said, it's just outside of regression. Decision trees, uh, XG boost, I see often nowadays support vector machines, a bit more classical neural networks. They were also in the nineties around uh, deep learning, especially in image analysis, that is quite, quite popular and successful. So um, move to the data part, the claims that any data is relevant. Hey, so, could I, could I, sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, could I interrupt for a second? I, I just wanted to, uh, ask a question at this point, and maybe you cover it later, but you know, the, the Leo Bryman article is very famous for lots of reasons, but one of the things that, you know, I think he came back to was like this idea that, um, you know, uh, statistics sometimes like focuses too much on formality and, um, you know, uh, maybe this is the part of that hacking culture of like machine learning, but growing up in like, well, just show us how well it works. And, and one of the things just even about this image that's really Im impactful for me is 
is in prediction, I think that that definitely works. But like it, it was even missing in your kind of translation di uh, de uh, definition thing. But how do you feel like causal inference and, and um, you know, it, like kind of the idea of, of causality and how that fits within this? Um, because that's a that's another goal of like statistics, right, is not just yeah. prediction, but maybe understanding. Yeah. Yeah, so, so on the first part, on, on that, that statisticians have a tendency to be a bit more formal and wanting to test assumptions, etc. And you may debate how relevant that is. That, that, that's, a, I think, a very fair comment. And I think, in general, we should, of course, match the, the, the method that we use to the type of question we have. So in prediction, if you're just predicting this, this say, probability of the outcome Y here, then yeah, some deviation of some assumptions may not be that bad if it makes your model quite robust, for example. Frank Harrell also wrote a lot about that. In, the, in principle, I asked him that. Huh? So for, what do we do with assumptions? And yeah, he's, of course, he said, well, he said, if a model fulfills the assumption, it will usually be better. But yeah, but, uh, should we then test for it? Well, that has this risk of overfit and uh, that you try uh, come too close to your data. Um, so some robustness may be traded against uh, testing assumptions, et cetera. And then on this causal, yes, you're right that that is, was not there. So the, I think that, the, that that is in development. I do not cover it too much here. Um, so maybe leave it that for, for broader discussion at the end. So to, to what extent machine learning has a role there? Maybe there are some examples where, where that are positive. I, uh, yeah, no, that, sound, that sounds fair enough. I, I just was curious as to your thoughts, because that is, that there's an areas of, in fact, like, I don't know if we have Jenna on, but, you know, there's several people who um, are just trying to, you know, use some of the machine learning methods and try to, you know, uh, bring them into like even causal models that people have talked about in statistics for a number of years, so. Yes. But anyway, I was curious. Okay, thank not you. Sure. No, I, I recognize that that that, that area, but I, I'm not really covering it in the in the later slides here. But um, yeah, so just to continue on the on the data part, um, that is essential, right? If you look at things like like uh, electronic health records, which are large in size, uh, which is nice, but, and then we hope maybe to uncover these patterns that are there but remained hidden. Um, well, the large n is there, large numbers of features, but the weak point in general is this quality. So selection of patients, how do they enter the, 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 this registry? And the start point definition, if you do prediction, when, when we said time zero, the end point definition, um, loss to follow up, uh, all kinds of selective measurements going on, missing values, uh, even in, in this strategy that you may generally try to follow. So EHRs is, is a fascinating area, but um, there are some positive stories, but, uh, also really quite challenging. Data quality is a general worry I have. If we contrast that to more traditional approaches where also the idea is learn from more data rather than enrich the data, enlarge the data sets that we have available, have learned better. And that is the, the Cochrane library, right? Which has this very nice uh, quotes, trusted evidence, informed decisions, better health. Well, we all like that. Um, and they, they strive for that by really systematically checking for a risk of bias. That's really an element of their culture and respect the clustering nature. So always stratify by study if that was reported. So here's one example. Just I did a quick search in the Cochrane Library on something on infectious disease. It was related to COVID in some sense, but not directly. And they check for things like, well, was there selection bias in the studies that we included, uh, allocation concealment, confounding selection. They all go through the, these typical epidemiological concerns. And that is, they have a strong tradition there. That is really different from the machine learning uh, difference, uh, culture, I should say. So uh, about data and this small joke, um, the, uh, someone says, well, use this CRS data, whatever, to size the market. And then the answer is, that data is wrong. Then, well, use the SIPS database. That data is also wrong. Well, and some may know the joke already. Can you average them? Sure, I can multiply them too. Right? So that, of course, it doesn't solve the problem if you have poor data uh, to, to do. That is, and no technique can, can surmount that. Frank Harrell also has this uh, quote uh, or, or, or some thought experiment five years ago by now on RCT uh, compared to observational data. And, and he has this, this yeah, he always likes to make strong statements that 
a RCT with 64 patients as accurate as infinitely large electronic health record data. So how does he come to this conclusion, this, this, this point? On the y-axis, we have this margin of error, estimating the difference in means, so the root mean squared error, and that, so that is bias plus variance combined. And this is for blood pressure examples, so millimeter mercury. Um, so he assumes there's a two millimeter mercury bias in the EHR data. So it's relatively easy and the x-axis numbers increase, more and more patients, and the estimate goes down to no difference with the biased estimate of two. So the root mean squared error is two at infinite sample size. Now what happens in a trial, you go down in with the variance, and, but you go to in the direction of zero. So at this point, and he calculates that at 64, they already cross. And we're assuming that the standard deviation is eight. So you divide by square root of the number, square root of 64, and then you come up with two here for this, uh, this root mean squared error. So the, that's why he claims 64 is as accurate uh, if there's this systematic bias um, as an infinitely large uh, electronic health record data set. So this is a, a kind of a thought experiment. I, he has no real data, I think, to support this, but just to, to, to um, really make us aware of this problem that bias is, is insurmountable. And it, if, if even a little bit of bias or two millimeters, not that much, and that would, um, would be better to do a trial with say 100, 200 patients, and you would uh, have a better estimate. Um, yeah, this, so then the third point on, on the promises, and I, I really feel strongly about that, that the hype element, I, I don't like that as a serious scientist, that uh, this idea of uncovering patterns and that remain hidden, that is in unsupervised learning. Well, I think most realize that this is kind of an unstable approach and right? learning about clustering and which patients group together. It's rather unstable and it, it's fully determined by how you define the clustering. We did some simulation studies recently on that. So this one paper in Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology, so it's one of their sub-journals on novel, novel subgroups for diabetes. And this was uh, validated or tried to repeat. And again, if, if, well, very inst unstable, very different clusters arose at validation than in the initial paper. So there was a lot of debate about that, but this was just um, using an, an unreliable method, basically. Yeah, I think, um, you know, this might be one of those methods that's well characterized when people say, um, you know, these, these uh, unsupervised learning methods are doomed to succeed because you can always, you know, you could always find these novel subgroups. But, um, you know, the assumption that these novel subgroups actually correspond to anything meaningful in terms mm -hmm. of pathophysiology is something that you see in the machine learning literature. They just assume that it does. Mm -hmm. But there's really very little evidence to suggest that it ever will, or there's any reason to believe that it will. Yeah, it's very data-driven uh, and, and defined by the algorithm. There are many variants, meteoroids, and oh, they have fancy names again, <laughs> the clustering techniques. And they, they, they are quite popular again. And I think that you know, with the rise of machine learning, it's also the clustering that is becoming more and more popular. Um, okay, so that's unsupervised and we're supervised uh, typically for prediction. I mean, we can use trees and neural networks and the claim is that they are better than regression. Well, let me just give you some examples um, um, against that. So a supervised learning example, this is uh, from Arthur van Smede, he uses it often, um, published in PLOS ONE, but machine learning models in electronic health records outperform conventional survival models. That's in the title. Now, how would this end up in the media? AI beats doctors. Wait, wait. This is electronic health records, conventional survival. Where are the doctors? David, were you, would you be involved in such a thing? There, there's no doctor anywhere. I didn't show you in the next slide. Here, this is just Cox versus Random Forest versus Elastic uh, Net. So different learning techniques, machine learning techniques, you could say these are more... Cox and ElasticNet are very close to just variants of regression modeling, I would say. 
Um, but there's not, nothing about doctors. So that's also very strange who came up with that conclusion. But anyway, if you look at the results, then uh, yes, there's some increase here with some variants of the Cox models, and with the fourth model being the best 30 variables, and that C statistic discrimination measure 0.79. Uh, random forest here that, that does a, uh, close to 0 0.8, 797. And then the best might be this yellow elastic net, uh, 0 0.80 with 600 variables. So there's a difference in information being used. And maybe doctors can only manage 30 or so. That may be the link, and 600 is a lot. But that's a horrible uh, y-axis, isn't it? The high axis, yeah, it starts as, uh, well, what is it, 0.75 or so? Right? Not even this, this uh, crossing uh, to indicate that it is uh, trying to lie with statistics a bit here. <laughs> Now, the differences are really tiny. Um, and there's a disadvantage that this random forest, they have this plot of the calibration. So the modeled risk predictions on the x-axis and observed on the y-axis that alive and here's some density and they do a smoother. The blue line, and you see so really some, some miscalibration here. That it should follow this straight line, but it does not. And that is a typical problem in, in trees that the calibration is poor. So the tech actually is quite quite okay they say well we found the random forest did not outperform cox models despite their inherent ability to include uh, and to accommodate non-linearities and interactions and that's the point that is often claimed as the flexibility beyond regression techniques and then they say well these elastic nets uh, they achieved the highest discrimination demonstrating the ability of regularization so that's a statistical technique actually it's statistical constraint on coefficients to select relevant variables and optimize coefficients. So they actually advertise the regression technique here with this addition of a regularization a penalty term. So that is really the strange thing that, that maybe the, the researchers themselves were, were quite reasonable in their conclusions, but the media and how it was, someone translated this to uh, AI beats doctors. Another um, systematic review, um, looked into this on, on this comparison of uh, machine learning versus logistic regression and that uh, that led to quite some debate it was together with gary collins from oxford and, and ben van gaster led that from leuven um well and on, on twitter was nice that this evangelia paper on logistic regression is equivalent to machine learning has generated many reactions and yes uh, that that we partly agree so for example we did not have any comparison of deep learning and image analysis because never a logistic model was done for that and that is maybe one area where deep learning is has some promise is, is positive so that's a uh, limitation of that what we did um the key results are these differences in uh, discriminative ability the discrimination so overall is first here any machine learning versus logistic regression there was an advantage of machine learning it seemed but then we try to separate in low risk of bias versus high risk of bias. So high risk is typically that some parameters at validation were tuned again from the machine learning model uh, or other uh, parts of the data were just the same in the, in the validation set compared to the, a development set. So this low risk of bias, that was actually then really leading to a neutral finding, really zero difference. Uh, and uh, also remarkably, trees did really worse. And, and I also have some work with some people and trying to do simulations where the trees, the classical card method was really worse than a classical standard logistic approach. So this, this is a kind of warning against the optimism on uh, machine learning being better for prediction. Um, well, and this is the cheating part. You can also skip that, but that is an example where all the fancy stuff was done and they had a very high AUC, 0.92, but then there's a commentary on, on the model can't can be run properly until you know about both the presence or absence of complications when the patient has left the hospital. So the prediction can only made at a later time point than uh, intended. So that's the, the cheating part, it cannot be true. So that's about um, these first three issues. Now, a um, bit more positive, so there are, of course, also quite uh, link, some, some links between statistics and machine learning where they are friends. So I think we should agree that the research question is key as a first thing and not have something like explanation is for the social sciences and with lo lots of wording and in the reasoning behind it and description is for statistics and prediction is for machine learning. No, 
all these these fields interact and and description of course can also be done with machine learning in principle uh, explanation is really we had this really interesting talk um, wednesday night i think some of us were there with uh, uh, lectures on explainability and the need for that or not needing that with machine learning that was uh, was fascinating but there are there so there are links between these these planets they, they should not be separate the research research question is key and i like this separation in, in say relatively simple questions exploratory questions descriptive questions and maybe prediction and classification uh, classification is especially popular in the machine learning field prediction is more classical regression and then uh, as, as we mentioned causal questions and i i think these are really the hardest questions and uh, causality so we see some people here uh, talking about that uh, john carlin he was at the uh, ISCB, the biostatistics conference, talking about this distinction and things he had done in his career. This is uh, Galit Shmuli. Uh, I hope I pronounced it right. To explain and to predict. That's also a really nice paper trying to separate uh, the different purposes of saying regression can be used either for explanation or very simple for just associations uh, to make predictions. And then this is uh, Julia Pearl, who wrote this uh, really nice, really interesting book, The Book of Why, very accessible but uh, very uh, thought-provoking, dif difficult huh, in, in, in practice. So to uh, continue that bit exploratory, I once heard this quote uh, by uh, Stevenson, uh, enjoy the results because you will never see these again. So that is on exploratory results. And, and in the 90s, we, I know I, I talked to Frank Harrell about that, that there was really this tendency to do data mining everywhere, to really dive in the data. And he was very worried about that. And that is because of this instability. Well, that's exploratory research, descriptive. I, I think I also do that a lot and try to just to see a bit what, what correlates and to learn, uh, learn about nature, get some insight. It's hypothesis generating often, I think. Biomarkers, for example, is how they relate to disease, to, uh, get some targets for future interventions, perhaps. So descriptive analyses, and um, yes, it's, I think it's, it's a big field, it's interesting. Machine learning provides more flexibility, but maybe less interpretability. That, that's a question. Well, many may agree with that. And then this, this issue of prediction, which I already covered a bit, uh, machine learning trees, they're often relatively poor, uh, um, especially in small data sets. I will give some example there. So the question is, may, where are the, 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 the advantages? There may be specific circumstances. I think that should be the, the friends uh, thing. Like there are some really challenging research questions where machine learning may be beneficial, and we still need to learn where that is. Well, at least we know that machine learning is data hungry. And you need lots of data sets. We did one simulation study here uh, to try to find out a bit on, yeah, it depends a bit on how you define that, but we did some modern tricks, the support vector machines, neural networks, they may need, may need over 10 times as many events per variable to achieve a stable AUC. So the criterion was stability and that you don't improve anymore in your performance and, and only have small optimism in the data fitting process. So you see that happening here, that the stability, that really the red line is a neural network. Then it needs really lots more data, 100 events per variable, and you're still probably increasing uh, before being stable. So is it good for prediction? Well, in the large N small predictor setting, small number of predictors, there's maybe this natural flexibility of machine learning techniques, but you could also achieve that with nonlinear terms and interactions in regression. And so that both are ways to deal with that. This was a simulation uh, with Peter Austin, who does a lot of simulation studies on predictive performance, machine learning, statistical learning. Uh, we simulated some large and small P scenarios. And well, the conclusion was that it, uh, yeah, the last line study confirmed that classical learning performed well in low dimensional settings. So we are not, I'm not too, too optimistic. Maybe others are more, but um, large and small p, I'm, I'm not um, thinking that that really helps. Well, what about large and large p? So really many predictors, a bit like this example of the um, AI beats doctors. There were 600 variables here. That is 473 in, in 400,000 UK biobank participants. So. This balance had a really large number here, many variables there. That's what I often see in the machine learning studies. 
And that, that is, a, to me, an open question, whether that, that, that really works. And the other field, and David, we have also spent time on that, had treatment selection and um, heterogeneity of treatment effect. This is a review from some years ago, machine learning approach to drug response, challenges and recent progress. Uh, and it's interesting if I read that, that immediately they not only talk about the data modality, but the data an analysis part, but they really also the information. So a single cell profiling uh, as, as a new thing, along with techniques that rapidly find uh, effective drug combinations. So I think they also refer here, not only to statistical techniques, but also to things you can do in the lab, for example. And yes, then, then you, you, you have extra value, perhaps. Um, the more classical approach is what, what David led, a really important initiative uh, published uh, some years ago with a huge group of experts involved, a PASS statement, predictive approach to treatment effect heterogeneity. Um, and there we do actually uh, something uh, based on risk uh, and assuming this is the one example in the Gusto data, uh, if you have a relative effect that is constant, so a proportional effect of the treatment, then you see here with the x-axis risk that the benefit on the absolute sense and the distance on the y-axis benefit by thrombolytics in this case, that, that increases with the baseline risk. And that is a kind of, yeah, some... I just thought about that this afternoon that Frank Harrell does not even call this heterogeneity of treatment effect because he calls it a kind of a natural process that if you if you assume that the effect is constant, yes, then there is a risk magnification or benefit magnification, actually. Uh, David, you want, may, may want to expand a bit on this idea, but I think it's really nice that it fits with classical statistical modeling well and it's quite robust. Yeah, I don't have, I guess, much much to add, I, I, you know, I think, you know, to the degree that nature conforms uh, to this kind of um, structure, then I think it's, it's obvious that, um, you know, these statistical techniques are going to do better than machine learning, but to the degree that there's a kind of hidden structure that's different from this, Mm -hmm. um, you know, then machine learning might be able to do better on some problems where that hidden structure needs to be uncovered, right? If you, you know, if you have sufficient numbers and sufficient variables to look at, and you, you know, as you said, that might that might be exactly what's happening in image analysis for. Yeah, for that, that's one field with where where machine learning is very successful. So really them to learn from that and borrow from and the complexity that is there and that may require that kind of techniques but it, yeah so but this is with observed covariates limited number at the order of 10 to 20 you can do a, a, a very straightforward risk model and then look for the uh, the treatment effect in relation to that risk so um we also did a review um david was was, was involved there as a phd student we have in uh, at erasmus in rotterdam on these different types of approaches, uh, just to, to reflect briefly, there's this risk-based approaches, method, uh, treatment effect modeling, so that uh, they, uh, they assume interactions, right? Prognostic factors and treatment modifiers, effect modifiers are there. So statistically speaking, there are interactions going on, uh, but also this optimal treatment regime methods. And I find the name again is, is fancy, uh, trying to really identify uh, for which patient does this treatment work and for, uh, the others, it doesn't uh, separate those with benefit from those without. Um, that's also really an active field of research. We had a, a talk some weeks ago on that, right? Um, uh, the, the, what is it? The one two months ago, uh, David, remind me, on, on these different uh, treatment uh, approaches, treatment effect estimations. But you, just, just to reflect that that is an active area of research. Um, okay, so, so I have two more statements. The complex data structure, they require innovative approaches. So that's actually what you were alluding to, David, I think, with image analysis, deep learning is really successful there, and that's happening in radiology, pathology, dermatology, all, all kinds of fields. Uh, really interesting to see how that will evolve. Another area is the free text analysis, natural language processing, NLP, that's being used in quite some projects now also that I see around me, detection of depression in an early phase, et cetera, that, that kind of projects. 
uh, mining electronic health records, building blocks for prediction. And so maybe we can do this as a pre-processing to learn, get some signal from, from free text and use that in a more classical prediction uh, further on. And also um, uh, pharmacovigilance in, in, uh, in social media as an example, really, really fascinating. So there are some, some promising areas. And yes, I think we should focus on the hard problems because there are some that, that don't expect machine learning to help us that much. Small n, small p, well, do, do something simple, regression. If you have uh, limited data, assume that there's a, just a linear straight line for something, don't go into machine learning. Small numbers and large p, well, that, that's genomics sometimes uh, with thousands of, of uh, SNPs. I, I put here low hopeless to be a bit provocative. It's really a difficult area if you have larger and uh, larger P than N, and that's famous issue. Uh, with large numbers and small number of predictors, this far I would rely on regression, although in principle, uh, because of the large N, you could be more flexible, but I've not seen convincing examples where you do better with machine learning. And then this open question, large N, large P. Uh, treatment selection, yeah, that, then is the, the bias versus precision. And uh, David uh, put this reference class problem central in, in some of his papers, which I really liked and learned from that this idea of, yeah, you want, may want lower bias, having patients who are really like you, but the precision suffers from that. And that, that is the, the difficulty. You can always try to uh, find pa patients that are more like you, but then, yeah, there are fewer and fewer like you left, uh, implying that the precision is really a problem. And finally, this causal interpretation and, and the role of machine learning, that's also, this is anyway a difficult area. So this is um, uh, my summary then, I think this is my last slide on them. Uh, my statement is that, that machine learning is not really new, uh, it needs to liaise with statistics, not, not be so uh, like we know better. Uh, data quality and bias, uh, design is the key issue, and we should learn from clinical epidemiology. They have a long tradition in uh, assessing quality of the data and, and biases, like in the Cochrane uh, review that I showed, that initiative. And don't make too many promises, um, and, and at least uh, don't make promises you cannot keep. The research questions need to relate to description, prediction, or causality, and that's increasingly difficult. And we need to recognize the power for specific complex data structures like images and natural language. Um, and then, yeah, we should work on the truly hard problems together. I want to end in a positive way. So um, I thank you all for your attention. This is the, the university building that we started off in uh, with our chat a bit. Um, thanks for joining in and I'm uh, happy to uh, engage in some further discussion. Great, thank you so much, Eva. So, you know, we'll open it up for questions. I guess I'll, I'll just start. Uh, we have about nine minutes left. But I, I just got back from study section. I think I was at the informatics study section and digital health. So I saw a lot of these uh, machine learning um, applications. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot like Eva, I was not very impressed with many of those applications. And I think the reason is, um, you know, I, if I think of the two cultures, the the culture of statistics is has a close alignment with, you know, epidemiology principles of study design. That, um, you know, the culture of machine learning has has you know, discarded to some degree. I mean, there's nobody does power calculations you know, and, and there's poor attention as, as Avad said to, to both that data quality, poor attention often to study design and poor attention to things that, you know, we routinely take for granted like bias and confounding. Um, I don't know. Do you want to react to that at all? No, I rec recognize that, uh, David, and uh, so could ask you what, what, what specifics are, but you, you already explained some of that, of the things that bother you in such a study section and meeting. But uh, for, for power calculation, you could say, well, that's kind of the, lu the luxury usually of, of these uh, machine learning approaches that they are applied in big data or really large data sets, usually. Uh, um, and then, yeah, I, I mean, like this example with the UK Biobank, if you have more than 100,000 participants, 
it's more about the study design issues and data quality issues than the absolute numbers. Uh, although with these very flexible approaches, yes, you also re you request a lot from the data. So you need, yeah, it's, so you could say you yeah, end up again with a relatively small data set because you address such complex questions or very complex methods are employed. So, so you know what I'll ask. I see Andrew has a, a question here, but uh, you know before I get to you know um, maybe we could ask Andrew to ask his question. But before I do, I just want to see if there's someone who wants to speak up for the ML side, because um, could be that you know Avout and maybe myself are misrepresenting things, and. Mm -hmm. um, um, and there's somebody who, who can better represent the ML side. Is there anybody who wants to um, speak up in that regard? All right. I guess I'll go for it, David, if that's okay. Yeah, please. <laughs> just, just for the sake of fun, because, you know, as you know, I'm, I'm certainly more on the statistic side than, than ML myself. But I just, I do wonder. Uh, I'm how sorry. You, uh, you know, I'm not saying who this is. Uh, oh, it's Jeremy Sussman. Sorry, David. Oh, hey, Jeremy. Um, so I, I guess I think the thing that was a little uh, hard for me to sort of get my head around is that I feel like you, you sort of made a bunch of comparisons using data sources that were really like friendliest to traditional methods anyway, and then kind of tossed at the end that, oh, by the way, you can do this in all sorts of situations where you simply can't do traditional statistics. And I guess, I guess the question is sort of, is, is the issue here that ML or AI is not as useful as we say it is? or simply that we're comparing it in a sphere that is particularly statistics friendly. Uh, you know, there's no logistic regression for Google Maps. And, and it seems to me that the, the excitement of AI is not in improving on traditional statistics, it's doing things that traditional statistics can't even imagine. Yeah, I think that's a very fair comment. And it's in, in line with the tweet that I showed on this comparison that we published on uh, where we could make the comparison between machine learning and logistic regression. And that is a subset of all the problems that could be considered. You're fully right in that, I think. So uh, maybe the criticism is specifically on uh, saying the more well-structured problems where the push is to use machine learning and AI because it can do better, which is an unproven hypothesis to me. Um, and you are right that Google Maps I love to use and the optimization of routes, et cetera, and speed rec uh, speech recognition, uh, with CD, et cetera. It's all amazing what's happening. So there are many fields that AI machine learning is promising. I, I, I had one, in, but in medicine, it's, it's still difficult to find. And, and that's why I emphasize maybe many of these unsuccessful attempts, like, like also uh, Dr. Watson. Uh, one successful uh, example to be on the positive side is on planning radiotherapy, where there was a machine learning algorithm that really did something that humans, even with 10 year experience, find very difficult. Uh, how do you get a dose at the tumor within as limited as possible with the different tissues around it? Uh, with a, uh, do that most efficient, AI beats humans. And I can see that because it's really multi. It's very complex. So that, that was a very nice example that we had in, uh, in the Leiden University Hospital. Andrew, do you wanna, um, I don't sure. wanna butcher your question. So why don't you ask it yourself? Yeah, yeah, I, I wrote a treatise instead of asking a simple question. So the, um, love the talk and agree with all the main points. I wanna just pick at some things or try and motivate your intuition on how to discern where within EHRs we're most likely to find kinds of situations uh, with respect to the data that where ML is likely to be useful, building off comments you made a couple of times, you know, that it, it's relatively successful in imaging, it's definitely successful in language, it seems feasible and probably desirable to consider approaches where certain classes of algorithms like deep learning might be used on waveform data or imaging or other kinds of sources generated in healthcare settings and shallower models are used with other more heterogeneous data and so on. Um, and I, I just, I guess I think yeah. you, know, you, were, you were hinting at this, but I think there's, yeah. we need heuristics to kind of find where the, the rich ground is to apply these kinds of things, perhaps using principles like things that are really close to direct physiologic measurements of 
patients, uh, you know, just understanding how to, how to guide us rather than lumping all EHR data into this, you yeah. know, generally is dirty and not worth, you know, the time. How do we, how do we make progress on those heuristics? Yeah. No, it's a great point. I, I think uh, I, I, my criticism is on two, two levels. So first is EHR data and are they reliable? What's the quality issue? We should not forget about that. That's a thing that that's one worry I do have. And you're right that there may be some characteristics like age and sex and other say physiological measurements that uh, are reliable. So if you just have them recorded, then that you can use that probably. Um, Although there is this, this really this issue of measurement, and we, we did some uh, one project where people in a GP uh, registry entered, yeah, during years, and some come often, some don't, etc. So there's all kind of selective data acquisition going on, and th that is a data problem. Then what to do with it, and and when AI might be useful? Uh, to my surprise, I never see big data logistic regression. It's always big data machine learning. And, and, and I don't like, like that link. If you are answering a simple question in EHR data, which is they say, suppose it's reasonable quality and it's at least very large, why not start with a relatively simple, well interpretable regression approach? So, so that's my, my unease, why immediately jump to machine learning? Um, but there may be, as you say, uh, situations, and I'm, I'm, I'm still searching for that, I guess, uh, where, ML, AI approaches have uh, an advantage over uh, classical approaches. Maybe if there's free text in these EHR records or there are images that you at least want to process with deep learning then before uh, including it in some other algorithm. But um, yeah, maybe you, you have some suggestions yourself that, uh, that that may be better. Uh, well, I, I kind of hinted at some. I think, you know, perhaps breaking down the, you know, Healthcare generated data into into places where we think there's either more structure or uh, less mediated observation of patients' direct physiologic state um, at a given point in time are are kinds of heuristics we might think about. Uh, some diagnosis, you know, the things are generated for billing purposes and are that are more subject to <clears throat> human interpretation and. Um, you know, are heterogeneous for for predictable reasons, I guess, and and more distal from what it is we want to actually uh, model and and predict uh, for pre you know known reasons. I guess those kinds of things are, are what I hope we as a community start to illuminate and and classify so that we can you know make progress and not throw everything out. Um, I and I will also say I think you know the Odyssey community does generally favor the logistic regressions and 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 issues you know yeah, here's this principle yeah thanks thanks for mentioning it i, I did yeah. not include it because of it was already quite a long, long presentation but odyssey uh, with, with their data model etc I, I like that initiative a lot and they use uh, especially lasso approaches or regression based mm -hmm. approaches mm -hmm. yes yeah. agree. you know I, I just saw that eric polly is on so um but unfortunately we're out of time I was going to ask Eric if he had anything. Eric, do you have something brief that you might want to add in terms of, um, you know, from brief? No. the super learner? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you need a full hour. Right. I was going to say, it was a great talk. <laughs> Nothing brief. Um, okay. Okay. Very I, I good. mean, I, I would say one thing I would throw out there is, I mean, you talk about machine learning for things like imaging and natural language processing. Those are good places for them. But I do think some of your final comments about, you know, being careful about study design and being careful about, you know, we, we've observed these characteristics that very deep neural networks with image analysis tend to be poorly calibrated, similar to what you saw with random forest. And so a lot of these things we saw with the sort of clinical prediction models come up in the imaging analysis and machine learning process as well. So I think a lot of those things still apply, even to areas where we're saying machine learning is doing well. Okay, thanks. Great. Thank you, Eric. Well, and thank you, everybody, for attending, yeah. and especially to you, Ava. No, thank it's, you very much. it's fun. Thank you for all the and, questions and the interaction. To be continued, please. Uh, yeah. Dave, thank you to me. Michigan again <laughs> for hosting. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye. -bye.